Thank you, Rina. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Rimona Margalit, and she will talk about uh, targeted nanoparticles for drug delivery. I would like also to mention that uh, at Tel Aviv University, most, if not all, the, 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 the researchers which are presented here are uh, being funded by specific funds which are targeted towards bridging the development gap and uh, uh, getting, uh, <coughs> uh, getting uh, the proof of concept, getting the, the uh, animal model, uh, uh, getting into animal models uh, studies rather than just stay in the in vitro stage. Good morning. Gagomers, the drug delivery technology I'd like to introduce today is the wide scope drug delivery technology in terms, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. In terms of the pathologies, the drugs, and the routes of administration. It was developed in my group by Dan Peer when he did his PhD with me and myself, and I'll introduce others as I go along. In order to demonstrate the power and the scope of the technology, I'll show you examples towards three different pathologies, three different drugs, and three different routes of administration. By, but first, what are the gagomers? They are particles that we make from biological materials. Hyaluronin is the shell of the particle, and it provides long circulation when administered intravenously, tumor targeting, and adhesion. Next is phosphatidyl ethanolamine, which forms interior clusters that can accommodate insoluble drugs, and then we have water regions that can accommodate soluble drugs. We can make them as nanoparticles. The bar here is 100 nanometers. We can make them as microparticles. The bar here is 10 microns in sizes in between. In the cancer area, I'll show an example from formulating Taxol in the gagomers in nanoparticles. Uh, the credit goes to Dani and Ilya for the work. And we tested it against the conventional free drug in Cremafor. And I'm sure we all know here that Taxol is a drug that is really crying out for a targeted carrier. We tested it in this uh, subcutaneous solid tumor model. And for actual active in vivo drug targeting, administered IV, you need long circulation and enhanced drug accumulation. And I'm showing you the two parts of it. This is the uh, drug in blood, when we give it by the conventional, where is this? When we give it by the conventional taxol cremophore, as you can see with the, here, the drug disappears very fast from the circulation. When we put it in our carriers, it has quite a respectable long circulation. At 24 hours, we sacrificed the animals that looked at biodistribution Red bars are our formulation, blue bars are the conventional, and I'd like to draw your attention to just two points. In the healthy liver of the tumor-bearing animal, our formulation manages to reduce the accumulation, which is a positive step. In the tumor, our formulation increases the accumulation tenfold, which is also a positive step, and these together give active in vivo targeting. It translates into improved therapy. This is tumor progression as function of time and treatment. Three IV injections by the green bars um, spaced a week apart. Animals that get only saline, drug-free gagomers or the conventional treatment all have exponential tumor growth, and these numbers are the full increase compared to the start. When we give it by our system, we get a linear progression very sl small slope, and it's less than two-fold increase compared to the start. And they're quite safe, negligible weight loss, and these two were found to be non-immunogenic. Moving on to neurodegenerative diseases, and the credit here goes to Lilach, uh, you want to deliver the drug to the brain. And we deliberately chose intranasal administration, which is a BBB bypass through the olfactory bulb. We took a model protein, human FC, and put it in some microgagomers and tested its accumulation in brain compared to free uh, protein in solution. These are the type of rats we used. We gave a single uh, intranasal administration and tested the accumulation six hours later using an assay method that detects only intact native protein. 
and the red bars are our formulation, and you can see that in the olfactory bulb, we get about two-fold increase in accumulation, and in the brain itself, four-fold increase. So there's potential in the neurodegenerative diseases. Another protein administration is in the diabetic area where the credit goes to Yaron, and we made nanofibrillar insulins in, insulin in microgagomeres, giving it by oral administration, and compared it to the conventional uh, treatment of ribonomeric protein insulin in buffer subcutaneous injection. I'm stressing protein fibrillation because it's usually considered to be a bad thing, an obstacle, and we managed to turn it into a positive asset, which may have implications for other therapeutic proteins. So here are the insulin nanofibers, and here you can see them inside microgagomeres. We made this uh, in vivo model of diabetic mice and tested the impact of a single dose of this in various controls, which I'll show you. Again, deliberately under human, normal human eating habits. The mice to begin with were pretty diabetic. This is blood glucose levels at time zero, and we gave a single treatment and followed uh, blood glucose levels with time. This is a data set testing for uh, eight hours. This is blood glucose levels as percent from what the animals had at time zero before we gave the treatment. And if you look with me first on the left-hand upper side, this is mice that received no treatment, a very little uh, drop in uh, BGLs. Uh, we made the necessary control of giving free insulin, peros, and as expected, it has very little effect. Uh, we tested, obviously, the conventional treatment, which is shown in the upper right hand, and as expected, the uh, blood glucose levels dropped within an hour, but they started coming back again, and um, this is as it should work. And the last thing I'd like to show you is this, which is our treatment given not by injection, but by the oral route, and the insulin levels come down very nicely and they stay stable for quite a few hours. To put these numbers in perspective, these percentages, I'd like to remind you that the diabetic mice to start with had 400 to 600 uh, BGLs, and normal mice, same strain and age, but non-diabetic, uh, have about 180 uh, values for the BGL. So it's about half to a third, and we're getting there. This treatment, the primary patient population, will be type 2 diabetics at the stage where, in addition to the other anti-diabetic drugs, they also need insulin. So uh, in conclusion, I've shown you a glimpse of the in vivo and the in vitro attributes of this drug and the formulation properties. I would also like to tell you that we have industrial-like production processes that are amenable to scaling up. Uh, we can put it on the shelf in a lyophilized form, and it's very stable. The gagomers themselves are stable to conventional uh, methods of sterilization. And in terms of future prospects, we see them, and I hope I've convinced you a bit, in cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, diabetes, and much more. Thank you for your attention.